Okay, brilliant. So welcome to another exciting seminar, which uh, this time will be on the impact of COVID-19 on global nutrition security. We have, I think, uh, an extraordinary panel. It's very rare to have uh, such expertise together on one panel. First uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Lawrence Haddad. He is the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Prior to this, Lawrence was the founding and co-chair and lead author of the Global Nutrition Report from 2014 till 16. And before that, he was director of the highly acclaimed and well-known Institute of Development Studies in the UK in Brighton. And before uh, joining IDS, he was the director of the Food Consumption and Nutrition Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute uh, in the 90s. And he was also um, the UK representative of the steering committee of the high level panel of experts, uh, HLPE, of the uh, UN Committee on food, uh, World Food Security. In June 2018, he was awarded the World Food Prize um, together with David Nabarro, the former special advisor to the UN Secretary General, and I believe he's currently the special advisor on COVID-19. The next speaker is Lauren Landis. Uh, she's the head of nutrition at the World Food Programme in Rome. She has spent most of her career working in the field of relief and development. She began her career in 1985 working for OCHA in Geneva before moving to the US Office of uh, Foreign Disaster Assistance within USAID. After several years with the NGO sector, including Save the Children, uh, Lauren returned to the US government to take up the position of director of the Office of uh, Food for Peace within the US Agency for International Development. Subsequently, Ms. Landis transitioned to the US Department of State in 2006, where she served as the senior representative on Sudan. And after returning to the UN, uh, Ms. Landis served in Rome, Italy for three years as chief of staff and director of the office of the executive director for the World Food Program. Um, so, you know, another exciting speaker. Then we have Patrick Webb, who is the ex Alexander McFarlane Professor of Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and policy at Tufts University in Boston in the United States. He was Dean for Academic Affairs from 2005 to 2014. Uh, Patrick Webb currently holds an endowed chair at the Friedman School, the only self-governing graduate school of nutrition in the United States. He also holds appointments at the Fletcher School of Dip uh, Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, at the Peyton Academy of Health Sciences in Kathmandu in Nepal, and at the University of Hohenheim in Stuttgart in Germany. Webb was previously Chief of Nutrition for the United Nations World Food Program from 2003 to 2005, and a research fellow at IFPRI. Then we have uh, Dr. Nahla Hawala. She is Professor of Human Nutrition and, res and Registered Dietitian with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in the United States. She also served as Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences at the American University of Beirut, from 2006 until 2017. Uh, recognized in Lebanon uh, and the Middle East for being the initiator and the driving force behind putting nutrition on the national and regional agenda. Um, she is uh, a highly respected uh, nutritionist and dietitian uh, here in the region and globally. She has provided Lebanon with the first and second country profiles on nutrition and established uh, the first NGO for nutritionists in Lebanon uh, in the Lebanon region, Lebanese uh, Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics, also called LAND. And then we have uh, Dr. Lamiz Joma. She is an assistant professor in the community nutrition, uh, in community nutrition at the Faculty for Agriculture and Food Sciences at AUB, and also an affiliate assistant professor at uh, Pennsylvania State University in the United States. She serves as, as the co-director of the Refugee Health Program within the Global Health Institute at AUB, and as a member of the Food Security and Rural and Community Development Graduate Programs at AUB. Um, so thank you very much for joining this panel. Um, as our first uh, speaker, we have uh, um, Lauren Sadat for his introductory comments. So please, Lawrence, the floor is yours. You're muted, Lawrence. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
if only it was that easy to mute me in real life. Um, thank you, uh, Martin. Um, thank you, colleagues. It's a, a real pleasure to be here and to be on such a such a great panel uh, and to talk about such an important topic. So the, the first question was, I think, is a really kind of a, a, a really difficult question, which is essentially what's the impacts and what should we do? What are the sort of key uh, intervention points as as the crisis unfolds? So the key impact routes, are, you know, I'm, I'm boiling it down and simplifying it, but through, I think through three routes on nutrition, of not, of, not of the infection so much, but of the response to the infection. Um, obviously, there's a big impact on uh, jobs and incomes. And of course, that makes, uh, makes it much more difficult to purchase um, good nutrition, uh, good nutrition inputs like good food, healthcare, um, water, sanitation, that kind of thing. Then there's, uh, there's a big impact on the rollout of nutrition interventions through the health system. Uh, health systems really stretch with dealing with COVID and understandably there, there will be um, a non-rollout, non non-coverage of some really essential nutrition programs. And the third route is we think through the, uh, in a, either the unavailability or the increased price of nutritious foods, things that are really important for good child growth and, and good uh, uh, growth of women and adolescents and everybody. So those three things are happening right now. And when you think about the crisis, there are sort of, I think there are sort of four phases to this crisis. The one is, first one is, there's this acute disruption right now to food systems and health systems and jobs. And who knows how long that's gonna keep going for. Most of the estimates I see say, at least until the end of this calendar year the acute disruption, even with some relaxation in some European and North American countries. Then there's sort of going to be a chronic disruption, at least for another year, uh, 2021. And I think that will only, only abate once there's a vaccine that's available and, and actually scaled up and everyone can actually use it and take it and get it. And who knows when that will be. And then, and then the, th the third phase is sort of a, uh, the recovery, the economic recovery begins to gather steam. And that will be, I think, through 2022. And then who knows when we will have recovered to where we are right now. Some people say it'll take 10 years. Some people say it'll take five years. Let's be optimistic and say it'll take three or four years. So what do we know about the impacts? So far, we, we don't know much about the impacts, actually. It's, it's kind of amazing we don't. I think the, the virus has, has shown us that our information systems uh, are not really good at picking up really rapid, rapid crises. And to be fair, this is a pretty, this is a pretty cliff edge thing. Normally when there's a drought, we have a few months to sort of get things uh, in line. This one, you know, was February was one world and March was another world for most, for most places in the world. So we, we think from some preliminary IFPRI estimates that we think uh, wasting rates may have gone up sort of about 20%. So the, not the percentage point wasting rate, but the, the increase in the rate of wasting may have gone up by 20%. That may, that may generate another five to, to 10 million wasted kids. We think um, from WFP's estimates, I think, and Lauren may clarify this, there's another 130 or 140 million uh, people in debt at risk of being acute uh, of, of acute hunger and we think uh, we know from the UNU estimates and IFPRI estimates that we think there's another 130 or 140 million people going to be plunged into poverty so we we think the impacts are going to be big even with mitigation strategies in place mitigation strategies have been slower to be put into place especially with nutrition and I, I could go on for a long time, but I know you want me to finish, Martin, but I'll give you uh, four points that I'd like to come back to later on. I think there are, and so the question is, what are the responses? I think there's four types of responses. One is they're in, they're in emergency programs that are in place now. You know, keep, let's keep immunizations going. Let's, let's keep the food system going. Let's protect food system workers. Uh, let's get social protection programs ramped up including nutritious food as much as possible. Let's get, um, yeah, let's get all that stuff sorted. Then there's kind of a, a second set, which is emergency programs that may eventually end up becoming the new normal. And I can talk a bit more about those. Then the non-emergency programs are still obviously relevant. 
but they may need to be done differently. So that's the third category of interventions. And then I think we're going to see fourth category is just some new programs will come on stream and I can talk a bit more about those later on. So I think I've probably talked enough, Martin, over to you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, we're going to now move to our second speaker for today, Lauren Landis. We'd like to ask you to please provide your introductory statement. What are the key impacts of COVID-19 on our food systems and food security? Okay, thanks very much. Um, and really nice to be here with, with such a wonderful panel and such a wonderful platform. Um, and I think I can just jump into what Lawrence has already said, but from maybe a WFP perspective. Um, there's no escape from COVID-19. We're looking at it from a global, a national, a regional, and a local level, and, and even an individual level. And it's in having an enormous impact on food health and protection systems. At the World Food Program, um, we of course look at the virus in, is virus's impact on food and nutrition and security. And in order to model that or project what might happen, or even quite frankly, just to, to, to guess, um, we really have to look at a number of global economic factors and then sort of see how they trickle down to uh, affect the world and the places that we most likely work from say Afghanistan to Ghana. So, you may not think of this in terms of the World Food Program, but we've really been looking at key intervention points um, and, and key factors that we at least can sort of start to model and calculate. So how do we stabilize food systems? How do we fill immediate gaps? Um, how can we support protection systems, social protection systems like a school feeding, but if school feeding school is no longer there, how can we have uh, take home rations? And how can we basically help governments to support uh, economies as they slow down uh, or shut down. And I'll talk about in a while about some of the things and the factors that we look at as we do this analysis country by country. But basically, given the time, as the Director of Nutrition, my concern um, is really the impact on the nutrition at all of those global, regional, and local levels. And as uh, Lawrence has already said, even before the pandemic, the numbers of malnourished were staggeringly high. Um, and our analysis that we're now doing almost to a country by country basis is showing that the impact on places, particularly that were already stricken with high levels of acute malnutrition, this is where we really think the impact could be devastating. Um, and as you all know, the, the UNICEF model, the sort of double whammy of having disease and having that linked with uh, high rates of, uh, of acute malnutrition, we're really looking at how this could have a double whammy. In other words, up till now, um, we haven't really seen children be the face of this pandemic. But with, as Lawrence has just said, the potentially higher rates of mortality in children and the growth in uh, acute malnutrition, both due to disease and the socioeconomic impacts, um, we're really critically focused on how, how and where this impact could uh, attack and therefore what is our best strategy? But I'll talk both about how we're doing that analysis and some of the uh, strategies that we're trying to take on later. I think I can stop there. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to Dr. Nahla Falla for your introductory statement, please. Um, well, um, I will, I will sp speak from the point of view of a developing country and what are we seeing here in terms of a different picture that you probably are seeing in the developed world? Uh, I, I got this impression that it's different because of my readings of how to tackle it, uh, how to tackle the issues of nutrition and food security in the West and uh, in countries like um, Lebanon, for example, uh, 
in terms of tackling food security or nutrition security or anything related to nutrition, it's not on the radar. It, it's the least priority. Although there is, it, it's well taken everywhere I read that this is a must here in this part of the world, it's not a priority. And when we talked about how the agriculture sector can, what can the agriculture sector do? What can the Ministry of Economy and Trade do? What can the um, uh, 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 you know, import export people do? What kind of nutrition advice we can give in terms of what food to select in, or what foods to afford in terms of the, the country uh, political and economical crisis, I got the answer from officials saying, we only deal with treatment issues. So I wanted to bring this up because I have seen it in some readings, but it was a little bit a shy uh, way of, of tackling it in terms of countries like this, where they import 90% of their food and the financial situation is dire. What can the people do? They go to the supermarket, everybody, everything was there. Now, even if it is there, they can't afford it. So how do we provide them with the tools? How do we provide the agriculture people with the tools and the knowledge to face this, um, you know, ferocious uh, uh, pandemic? And um, are questions that are being asked at the UN level. I understand that ESQUA has been raising these questions and I hope that the panelists will help us with some ideas. Thank you very much, Dr. Fala. We'll turn now for the introductory statement of Professor Webb. Thank you, Rachel and, and Martin and everyone for, for joining and the, the great pleasure. Uh, and honor of uh, being part of this panel. So yes, we, it is a dire condition, uh, the uh, strange times that we're all in. We do have to worry about treatment. There's no question that when you talk about malnutrition, uh, that being malnourished is a condition which exposes particularly children, but, uh, but others to higher risks of mortality than they would were they well nourished, right? So Lawrence and I were part of the, the Lancet series on maternal and child nutrition and those, that came up with estimates that you know, severely stunted children have maybe six times higher rate, risk of mortality, severely wasted nine times higher risks of mortality and both stunted and wasted in the same child, 12 times higher risk of mortality if exposed to practically anything, whether it's measles or, or uh, pneumonia or other health threats, let alone COVID, right? So risk of mortality is closely tied to being malnourished. But being well nourished obviously goes well beyond treating those conditions. It's all about prevention. And it's all about ensuring both an, a, a healthy diet uh, on an ongoing basis and I'm not going to go into you know, the, the, the individual nutri-centric nutrients that, that some people have talked about, but it's healthy diets in the context of the health system provision that uh, Lawrence talked about uh, and the caring practices that uh, enable children to be well-nourished. So I'm just gonna talk about actually two things to put on the table in, in addition. Um, one is information and the other is misinformation. And I think both are critical in the context of this, this particular crisis and crises in general. The first one information Lawrence already alluded to is this has exposed just how weak and how limited our real time collection and dissemination of information is, not just on the impacts of the crisis, but the mediating factors, obviously relative food prices, but also what we don't know much about food prices relative to other essentials that people need to buy, whether it's gasoline, uh, kerosene to cook or not, right? Or, or transportation costs to get to, to work. We, we don't have the systems that help us to tailor the right kinds of interventions, 
nor do we have very good systems for assessing both the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of the interventions that are put in place. And a lot of countries around the world have jumped in with giant stimulus packages. Many of them are involve cash transfers and other social protection activities. Others um, are debt relief or subsidies for fuel and a, a range of things. Often not very evidence-based and often not well monitored. And if we are to learn about not just the impact, but what works in responding to these kinds of crises, then we absolutely need to be doing better at share, sharing uh, good empirical information on what is happening. That means focusing on what matters. And I'm just gonna give two examples that we may want to learn from, uh, from previous crises. One was the Asian financial crisis of the mid to late 1990s that really swept across South, South and Southeast Asia, caused all kinds of problems in terms of rising food costs of staples as well as non-staples. But large donor organizations and global loaning organizations were unsure what to do. And I was involved in one activity in Indonesia that looked at trying to understand what is the impact. And what they looked at was, are we seeing underweight or wasting in children rising in, across Indonesia? And they commissioned a, a group to go in and do very large scale surveys and came back with the answer, actually, no, we're not seeing a big increase in underweight or wasting. And the large global donor organization took that and said, well, okay, well, maybe we've been overestimating the problem and maybe we won't be dispersing special drawing rights in quite the same way. Just a couple of years later, those same data, which were based on ongoing national led data collection activities showed that the reason that there was an increase in underweight in children was because mothers and some fathers were buffering the consumption of their children they were eating significantly less than normal to protect the con consumption of the child. And the mothers were becoming seriously underweight. But at the same time, both the mothers and the children saw a huge spike in anemia in the years during, and of course, in the years following. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the immediate crisis mode is one thing, but the effects on nutrition can be seriously lasting. And quickly, I know we can come back to that with other examples, but misinformation, I think we really also, as part of the intervention package, need to be dispelling some of the many, many myths. Of course, one can increase immunity, immune system function through selenium and zinc and iron status, but it's not just popping a pill of an individual nutrient. And we've seen in the literature people proposing vitamin D as the solution to COVID or certain drinks or equally dangerous in Ethiopia, the myth that COVID is carried on fresh fruits and vegetables, therefore avoid fresh fruits and vegetables if you want to avoid COVID. That kind of misinformation can be equally additionally damaging in terms of nutritional outcomes. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that, Professor Webb. We will now turn to Lamy Jama for her introductory statement. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel and Martin. Um, as all the distinguished speakers said, basically, it's an honor to be here today. And I'm going to basically just also in a couple of minutes uh, with my introductory remarks, just kind of um, touch upon many of the issues that were addressed, but also give it um, a touch more from the Arab world and from the MENA region, given where we are as our institution and where we've been working. As we've all agreed, the COVID-19 has taken us on a storm. It's an unprecedented crisis and, and the cost on human lives is quite big. But I think what's, what's still missing, and as just Dr. Webb was saying, is the lack of information about how much the impact is on all um, aspects, including food and nutrition security. Um, at a global scale, as well as in lower and middle income countries, where many times the systems are not there to actually assess acutely what's going on uh, with, with all, uh, with all what's, with the impact of COVID-19, whether it be in terms of economic impact or social impact. 
Um, what is worrying us, of course, all of us, is that there is a global recession or there is, the pandemic is triggering a global recession, uh, definitely in more weaker um, economic uh, countries. Uh, we're worried that all the containment measures, the social distancing, the lockdown, the restriction of movements is going to affect uh, primarily unemployment of um, those who are working in the informal sector as well as in like the service sector, which is according to the recent estimates I was reading, it was going down by 50%. And of course, the disruption that is affecting uh, our food supply chains and, and just disrupting entirely our food system, I think. And that's something that we're all reflecting on today as well. Uh, my concern is that, and, and many of us, is that this is a health crisis that might turn into a food crisis if the right response measures are not taken into consideration, especially in the most affected countries. Um, just as we were talking about malnutrition and its impact, just prior to the crisis, we just kind of go to last year's State of Food and Security report. We were not doing great either. And I want to just kind of remind us that this is a pandemic that's adding uh, a lot of pressure on, on um malnutrition rates that are quite high. So we were estimating 800 and some million uh, individuals globally between 2016 and 2018 being undernourished. Um, and, and most of them, the majority are actually in lower income countries. If I were to take the picture to the MENA region, uh, the, the prevalence of moderate and severe food insecurity was reaching uh, almost 30%, that's 150 million individuals. And the prevalence of undernourishment, if we were just to take within the MENA, the Arab countries that were undergoing the Arab uprisings and all the conflicts that may have stemmed out of that, uh, there was a doubling of undernourishment just between 2010 and 2018. And that to us is definitely alarming, just comparing within the Arab countries, those that are affected by those conflicts versus those that are not, there was, there was quite a difference. Um, and just recently, the WFP report that was talking just prior to the pandemic, they were presenting the results of acute uh, food insecurity. And again, the numbers are stunning. There is around 183 million that are um, either classified in stress conditions or slipping into the uh, into the crisis, uh, or worse, if you may, uh, based on the classifications used. And the concern that I think the report was bringing up and all of us are bringing up is that the, the COVID-19 is going to only aggravate those conditions that were pre-existing. And, and all the social determinants of health that we, or the lack of in some aspects and in some countries and in some communities that will also be aggravated because of this pandemic. And I think the estimate of the report was that we might reach a doubling of the acute food insecurity just by the end of 2020. So again, like uh, Lawrence said at the beginning, uh, this is a crisis that we're just probably still in the phase one and we're seeing such uh, projected impact. Again, projections um, plus minus on those numbers. Um, and I think when, when I think about it, and this is where my bias comes in, is I'm thinking a lot about vulnerable communities. I'm thinking about who are going to be most hit in this. And of course, we, we always think about children, we think about women, we think about, um, we think about adolescents, of course, and we also think about elderly. But we can't forget the migrants, the refugees, the informal workers, those that are living in conflict affected countries, uh, Arab countries that are going through that, Yemen, Syria, uh, people that are displaced in Jordan, in Turkey, in Lebanon. Uh, we're talking about 40% uh, of the world's displaced population in the Arab world, which is only 5% of the world's population. So the, you know, the, the ratio uh, is quite high in Lebanon, um, given where we are, I can't but mention um, we are presenting uh, the highest per capita concentration of refugees worldwide. So there's a lot to be talked about. The recent ESPA report was wondering if the poverty rate is going to push an additional 8 million into poverty in the Arab world uh, because of COVID-19 and that the undernourishment and food insecurity might increase also by 2 million. So numbers are freaking us out in this region. And as Dr. Huela was mentioning earlier, and we're going to tap into this also throughout today's discussion, there are so many parameters that were that were affected for us in terms of food availability as net food importers, in terms of food access, the purchasing power has been has dwindled dramatically, uh, let alone among the host communities, let alone among the refugees and the migrant workers. Uh, there's a lot to be talked about also in terms of the purchasing behaviors. I think I want to talk about the panic buying and the, and the hoarding that is still happening among some kind of middle or higher income classes and how that is triggering in terms of its influence on, on the other more vulnerable communities. Uh, there's much to talk about, so I'm going to pause here as well. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Lamis, and thanks everyone for the, you know, I think very useful and important introductory statements. The first question we have, uh, first moderated question, goes to Lauren, Lauren Landis. Um, the World Food Programme recently published uh, the Global Report on Food Crises that highlighted the challenges of acute food and nutrition insecurity, particularly in lower 
and middle income countries. To address the projections of increased food insecurity and malnutrition, what actions and interventions need to be scaled up? Thank you, Martin. Yeah. The, this year's 2020 Global Report on Food Crisis really, really paints a, a daunting picture. Um, it basically says that COVID could push off further 130 million into what's called severe hunger on top of another 135, so a total of 265, 265 million in 2020. Talk about daunting uh, numbers. And of course, to derive these, the, these figures, uh, there was a lot of analysis done at looking at prices of primary commodities, exports, oil, tourism, remittances, debt loads, foreign direct investment. Um, and those are the ones that we don't usually look at because we're usually focused on uh, economic stability and, and conflict in order to, to produce our numbers. But this year we even had to look at um, you know, the government policies related to COVID in trying to project. I would, I would really say that, of course, even this analysis only gives us indications, but our job, uh, of course, we hope that Patrick is right and that there will not be severe crisis or severe impact on malnutrition, but our job at the World Food Program is really to prepare for the worst case scenario and to be ready to respond to it so, so as to hopefully uh, mitigate uh, the impact and sufferings. So what we've had to start to do, and I, I would agree with Lawrence, we're still really in that first phase and thinking about how to address that acute disruption. And so now it is really about how we can help governments to help with basic services. How can we make sure um, that health services or nutrition services more likely, we don't do much with health services, continue. How can we help to continue or um, to build a social protection systems that governments may need to put in place uh, as a result? So maybe I could just give you a couple of examples of what we're doing in this very much acute disruption phase while we're trying to do further analysis to understand better the impact that we think we'll see in the longer term and then to, to prepare for that. So the immediate immediate for, for nutrition, uh, particularly in the, in the sense of prevention and treatment services, as was mentioned early, is, is to really look at how we need to adapt, say, uh, program services. So if you don't want a whole bunch of mothers and children going to a health uh, center, how can you move that closer to the community? How can you monitor that risk through mobile clinics or outposts? Um, how can, can you give mothers tools to better measure uh, their children's nutritious status? And can you give mothers better tools to watch um, diet consumption, et cetera, in these difficult times, understanding uh, that availability of and affordability uh, also plays a huge impact. Can we focus more on how to make sure that health centers, when you have to go, with your child have the right, you know, of course, hand washing, but can we use new technologies to do less weighing and measuring um, of children? So a low touch uh, option. And how can we really use social media in certain cases and other tools to really work on that behavior uh, mitigation and behavior, social behavior uh, change and communication? But a lot of times we're looking at assessment tools. So if we already know what it costs for a poor family to eat a nutritious diet, we then can go in and look at with just a little bit of price monitoring, how the cost of, the, of consuming that diet may have changed. And once we know what's not no longer available or what's no longer affordable, we can look at programmatic inventions that might try and ease 
those pressures, whether it's through social protection uh, tools or, or other um, mechanisms. And, and I think I'll leave it there, although I could uh, go on with lots of examples. Um, I think that's a good point to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Our next question is for Professor Patrick Webb. Could you please comment on how resilient the global food system is, in your opinion, to the possibility of multiple lockdowns due to COVID-19? Just a small question, uh, Rachel. Um, how resilient is the global food system? Well, let's see. Uh, it probably is a little too early to, to answer that. I think what we're facing here is different things playing out differently in different places, but also the paradox that, you know, for example, the 2007, 2008 food price crisis, um, landlocked and remote countries saw a relatively muted effect of price transmission. So the global price went through the roof, but in some places, remote parts of Niger, remote parts of Afghanistan, those price effects didn't necessarily knock on and ripple down basically because of a lack of inter interoperability or engagement with the global markets. Um, that protected them then. Today it's different, but what we have to understand is that past food crises were often triggered by drought or locust-driven harvest failures or you know, trade restrictions in response. And what we're seeing in the, let's say, the new nutrition crises, they're, they're increasingly about lack of access to the right foods, right? Relative prices of nutrient dense foods versus calories. They're also relating to lack of agricultural labor, partly due to the lockdown, partly due to ongoing urbanization and the, the stripping of urban areas of young uh, agricultural labor. Um, so we do, as Lauren says, we need assessment tools that are relevant to the problem and relative food prices or the cost of a diet is one of those. I think we also need to include wage labor prices, the daily wage labor prices that in some places have collapsed uh, due to lockdown um, because uh, no one is able to go to the fields, but in other places, uh, where there's less lockdown, um, wage labor prices have gone up uh, because there are still farms willing to engage, right? So we have to be looking at the right things and looking at the uh, at many different places to see how this will um, play out. So I'm, uh, uh, Lauren, I'm not saying there won't be an increase in, 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 the, in acute malnutrition. Uh, there may well be. Um, but at the same, and absolutely, we have to plan for and prepare for the worst. Um, but I think the focus on the immediate has to incorporate a focus on what we want over the long term. So I'm coming back to the, the word resilient. Resilient uh, in this context means that we, we don't just want a food system that can bend rather than break and continue in the same way as it always has. Uh, there's a big push, a big argument that resilience means that we have to transition, take this kind of opportunity, this crisis as an opportunity, start thinking how we can transition food systems to better deliver healthy diets to everyone in, su in sustainable ways in future years, right? So not just more of what we have and make it, protect it, make it more resilient, um, but move towards something better. And that is gonna be quite a challenge in this context of uh, constrained resources, um, but it is a challenge that the globe needs to take on in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Patrick. Uh, the next question goes to uh, Lauren Sada. Um, how is COVID-19 shaping access to nutritious food? And what measures can be put in place to mitigate the adverse impacts of COVID-19 on nutrition-related diseases over the longer term? Should there be perhaps more campaigns to you know, address certain foods which could uh, provide uh, nutrition during this 
cheap nutrition during this uh, difficult times. Uh, Lawrence, I, I have to unmute you, and now you're. Yes, you're unmuted now. Thank you, um, Martin. Thank you for the question. So I have like three parts to this to my answer. The first part is just to remind everyone how important nutritious food is. Um, it's the number one. What we eat is the number one driver of the global burden of disease. What the, the quality of what we eat. Uh, poor diet is the, is the number one driver. When you look at all the other things that can affect the global burden of disease, poor diet is it is number one. Um, a number that I always find shocking, even pre crisis pre COVID crisis, is that uh, you know it depends on the country and the region, but roughly twenty percent, only twenty percent of kids under the age of two, actually have a decent diet. Uh, the the, the, uh, the metrics are minimum diet diversity and minimum diet adequacy, adequacy of diet. Um, between six months and 23 months of age, I think it's about, I think it's about less than 20%. So 20% get a minimum. So poor young, very young kids are especially vulnerable. And the third thing to remember pre pre-COVID is that the prices of nutritious food relative to staple prices were going up in most parts of the world. So this is this is even before the crisis has hit. Then the crisis hits, and the response to the crisis is is really understandable and 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 probably very wise and necessary. But it does two things: it it, it kills off demand because it kills off jobs and kills off income. But it also disrupts supply. Uh, and Patrick's quite right. the The two thousand eight you know, food price crisis was about you know, oil prices and fertilizer and biofuels and droughts. So it was very much a production price uh, crisis. This is a, this is an everything crisis, every sort of the whole food chain from farm to fork kind of crisis. So you've got this weird situation where supply is going down and demand is going down. So you might think actually prices are, are gonna be okay. But as one of my former bosses used to say, uh, it's kind of like that situation where your head's in the oven and your feet are in the freezer. You know, on average, you're okay, but of course, you're not okay. Uh, and and I think what's what's happening here is that you'll we some of the, some of the country reports we're getting from the Gain country offices in Africa and South Asia are showing uh, you know piles of nutritious food over here rotting because mm -hmm. they can't be moved to markets and big deficits over here um, and prices skyrocketing. But even if prices weren't going up. Of nutritious, nutritious foods, you've got you've got incomes going down, so so families just can't. Even if prices are the same, they still can't consume as much uh, nutritious food as possible. So there's a problem, no matter what scenario we come out with here. So there there are, there's a very long list of things one can do. Um, but I think of it quite simply as let's keep let we, off, we obviously have to bolster income. Uh, income through social protection programs and other kinds of programs. But uh, ultimately, we have to keep the food system going, seems to me. Um, and the things we can do to keep the nutritious food system going, whilst also doing a, some uh, doing playing a part in bolstering income and demand, is number one, and these are three things that GAIN is doing at the moment in, in the 10 countries we work in. Number one is keep small and medium enterprises going. You know, in most countries, in, in low and middle income set contexts, uh, small and medium enterprises is where the most vulnerable people get their food from. Uh, they don't buy from big supermarkets and big, um, big companies. They buy from the smaller markets, from the, from the small companies. Uh, those SMEs, small and medium enterprises, they have very little reserves of working capital. I was looking at some data today from the UK said only only two or three percent of UK SMEs think they're going to go bust. Um, a lot of them will, will have to, a lot of them have reserves to keep them going. In much of Africa, and I would imagine in MENA and South Asia, that's not the case. They don't have the working capital to keep going. So if someone doesn't pay them an invoice, they're stuck. They, they just have to lay, lay people off and stop producing and stop processing, stop distributing, stop marketing. So that's really important. So getting finance to small and medium enterprises, whether it's emergency grants or emergency loans, really, really important. Uh, 
Um, second thing is food system workers. You know, in, in Europe and North America, everyone's kind of woken up to the fact people don't, most people, unless you're extremely poor and using food banks and the, and the like, most people don't think too much about their food supply. They just kind of go to the supermarket or they get delivery over the, over the internet. And all of a sudden people in Europe and North America are, are worried about their food. Uh, can I get the food I want at the, at the price I want, at the time I want, at the quality I want? Uh, and do I have to go to three places to get it or just can I just go to my regular one place? And I think there's a recognition in Europe and North America of the essential nature of food system workers and how important those workers are and how, how, how at risk and how vulnerable they are actually. So the, the essential nature of food system workers is, has really been revealed, I think, by this crisis. And uh, we are working very hard to, to provide social protection to food system workers through, through the companies, the big companies that have big value chains that reach into the smaller companies. Uh, we're using uh, public funds to catalyze much bigger resource flows from the big companies to support their value chains. It's in their interest. It's another component of res the resilience of food systems, because once this crisis abates and the recovery begins, those big companies want their value chains to they want their value chains to be intact and be ready to be able to spring into life. And that means keeping those food system workers um, healthy and, and well nourished. And the third thing that's really important to keep nutritious, safe food flowing is keeping wet markets open. Wet markets are where uh, a lot of a lot of fresh food, sometimes live animals, um, uh, keeping them open. A lot of them have closed down through uh, fears around food safety, but also fears around um, social distancing, not having enough personal protective equipment. And so we're doing a lot of work on protocols, working with local governments to keep those food markets open, because if they close down, then uh, the whole system just grinds to a halt. So there's some very practical things that need to be done to keeping food systems and food, uh, food supply chains going, especially for the nutritious foods, which are much more vulnerable to disruptions than, than cereals and root crops. Our next question is for Dr. Nahla Hwala. Dr. Hwala, how do you see COVID-19 impact uh, efforts to promote sustainable diets? And what can be done to promote healthy, affordable, and sustainable diets in a post-COVID-19 era? Well, um, as uh, has been mentioned by a um, few of the speakers, the issue of sustainable diets and addressing sustainable and nutrition security was a, an, an issue that uh, we in the school actually were um, interested in and um, pursuing uh, before COVID-19. Now, um, having COVID-19, I'm gonna uh, put in, uh, on the table a, a, an actual situation where we have been approached by the media by people, by relatives, by friends, asking us, with this limited amount of money that we have, what can I buy so that what I buy is healthy and the cheapest of available? And you mentioned, of course, you mentioned the, the uh, cost of the diet. And this cost of the diet is not something international. It goes country by country and even maybe city by city. It depends if you grow food, then the cost of the diet is different from a place where you import that food. So this kind of, of knowledge now becomes much more important than, than before because you want to provide people with the knowledge in order to make the best of the limited resources that they have in order to eat well. So I went into this uh, process of um, costing a least cost diet. Let's, let me call it a least cost diet. For whatever we have in the market, I have screened all the costs of all food items in the market and reached the situation where I wanted to use the save the children cost of the diet um, uh, tool 
uh, that uh, I think uh, Tufts has uh, also contributed to its uh, production, but we don't have access. I want to tell you that here in Lebanon, once we want to access certain uh, uh, websites or from the West, I think we are blocked because no one in the IT department or something could access that. So I'm going to uh, request at the end of this from Patrick or from Lawrence or from you, Lauren, to provide us with that one, because really this is important for us. Maybe it is not for other parts of the world, but for us that we are importers and we want people to eat healthy, to develop those simple limited guidelines for them that if you go, this is your priorities. And for the government, what should they import? And maybe not only what should they import, what should they stock? What is the most important items that they should have uh, avail available for the community? So I, I would, you know, request your help in that particular uh, aspect. And the sustainable diet, of course. I mean, this is something that is not for now, also for the future. And I think that the tools that has been provided by the high level panel and um, by the global burden of disease provide quite new information for us to uh, provide this kind of advice in a more knowledgeable and a more evidence-based way. Thank you very much, uh, Natla. Uh, the next question goes to Lamiz Joma. And just to put this a bit uh, into uh, perspective, uh, the prices in Lebanon have gone up uh, by at least 60%. Uh, and going to a supermarket these days is as expensive as going to uh, a Gucci boutique in, in previous years. So it's uh, mind blowing. So the question is really, how does this affect um, the health and nutrition of the most vulnerable communities, including migrants and refugees, because as you all know, Lebanon is one of the uh, major uh, destinations for Syrian refugees uh, in, at the moment. So let me, can you answer this question? Sure, thank you, Martin. Uh, I think this is exactly actually where I wanted to go in, in the introductory remarks when we we're talking about food prices. Uh, they may not be increasing in all places equally, but definitely in Lebanon, given the question that, that you just raised with an economic recession, with political instability, with national protests that have been starting in Lebanon since September, October, excuse me, 2019, till today, the food prices have increased uh, according to the recent WFP estimates, just looking at the food price, uh, the food basket prices, uh, particularly with refugees, they looked at 40% on average increase just in that period. And, and I'm sure that during the current analyses that the April months and May are actually increasing even dramatically. How does that affect? It affects the entire Lebanese population. It affects the refugee population in particular uh, more because their purchasing power has been dwindled dramatically. And before the crisis, I also like to remind myself that the situation was also dire. Um, I think the, there, there are thousands of refugees, registered Syrian refugees, uh, for example, in Lebanon that are receiving UNHCR and WFP support, food and cash transfers, and that's been life-saving. Uh, however, and school, uh, school meal programs are being offered to refugees as well as uh, Lebanese children in public schools. And there's, there's actually uh, an extensive humanitarian community and work being done with local organizations. And, and this is actually uh, something that I believe has, is giving Lebanon a bit of resilience in the middle of this shock at the health level, at the health system level. Um, when it comes to our food system, when it comes to like its impact on the purchasing power, the, the majority of refugees are dependent on food aid. And because the food basket now is way more expensive, whatever cash transfer modalities are being provided are not being able to basically match the need. So, um, and, and that we're talking about basic food, basically, we're talking about burgul, pasta, beans, uh, legumes, um, not touching upon the uh, animal uh, protein uh, sources uh, that are unaffordable for the refugee community, even prior to the crisis, uh, except maybe once a month for meat and eggs, maybe a little bit more uh, available. So, there is a need definitely to monitor and stabilize the food prices in our context. This is, uh, this is actually a big, uh, I think, gap in our governmental institutions currently that there is really no uh, handling of the food prices. Currently, uh, I think there's a lot of work being done, as I said, between the UN community and the international community and the government, but uh, it hasn't been, uh, been put on the front burner. Unfortunately, as has been mentioned previously, the national priority for Lebanon 
Fortunately, it's been a health crisis. However, the, there is a lack of, of any, if you want, national emergency strategies or response plans for refugees. It hasn't been adopted by the government properly for many reasons that are beyond today's maybe talk. But I want to say that the, that is one issue that I'm acknowledging, which is the food prices and the food purchasing power. But there's other things that I want to talk about when we talk about nutrition security here. And it's, it's what living conditions are the refugees uh, living in and those vulnerable communities and the migrants that are living in confined spaces, informal tented settlements. Um, this is not a space that allows for uh, physical distancing or frequent hand washing. Uh, availability of water, let alone soap, let alone cleaning detergents is pretty limited. It's actually pretty expensive. And with the price... Uh, inflation of um, and this currency uh, depreciation, the price of the non-food items are actually way more expensive. And as you said, Martin, the 60% increase, we're seeing it in cleaning supplies as well. So we have an issue to address there. And I want to look at this as an opportunity for us to revisit how the refugees are living and where they're living, because this is a fertile soil for infectious diseases and outbreaks. And I think one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest fears that we have globally uh, is what is the next epicenter of the crisis? You know, are, is the fourth wave going to be beyond China and Europe and the U.S.? Is it going to be in the lower middle income countries that have the highest refugee populations that live in concentrated and, you know, and crowded spaces? I think this is where we're all um, holding our breath and we're, we're praying and trying to kind of uh, work our best. And, and I know that Lauren will probably uh, talk more about that and, and, and have way more examples. But, but this is from, from my perspective, from, you know, our own work here, um, I've had the, uh, I've had really the the good honor of working with with the refugee population in the country, and there's lots to be said. Um, one further point, um, just to point out, is the access to healthcare services. This is something that we're very worried about. Limited access to healthcare, particularly during the restriction of movements, uh, limits our ability to get the children to be immunized. Limits our ability to give the chronic uh, diseases uh, the medications that are needed. We know the refugee population have underlying health conditions. And if they can't access the healthcare center, uh, they can't get their they can't get their chronic, you know the the medications for their diabetic or hypertens hypertensive patients. That's really going to aggravate the situation. Um, and I also want to uh, just kind of bring the final kind of thing when we talk about nutrition. I always like to think about the mental health aspect of it. Uh, the refugees are currently being, in some instances, stigmatized against. There's already challenge with that with the host community in some places because of the fear that, the, that there might be a spread or an outbreak within these camps and within these uh, communities, then there's even further stigmatization that may happen at the community or even at the state level that we need to be very careful about. And I know in Lebanon, there's a lot of work being done in protection um, you know, to reduce gender-based violence, to reduce stigmatization, uh, but there's really much work to be done because that affects, again, if we're to think about the classic UNICEF framework, and, and we cannot just think about the food security angle of it or the purchasing power. We have to think about all the other aspects, access to healthcare, and the, 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 all these living, you know, social determinants of health and conditions that will aggravate the situation if COVID-19 was to exist in these populations. I think we, we definitely need to be, uh, be careful on that. Uh, I'm sure others have more to say, so um, I'll stop also here there. Our next question is for Prof uh, Lawrence Haddad. Lawrence, there's been mention here about the opportunity to look past COVID and improve, improve uh, the food system and its relationship to nutrition. So will COVID-19 disrupt our food system to the point where it could cause a radical positive change in food policies and how we produce and consume food? And if so, what are the types of changes we might hope to see? Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, you know, the, the Chinese symbol for crisis has two components, uh, threat and opportunity. So we have to seize this opportunity. We have, to, we have to make this crisis an opportunity. So the first thing that I really note is that um, I think a lot of governments have woken up to the fact that, and, and businesses and civil society groups have woken up to the fact that food systems really matter. They can't be taken for granted. They, it, when you when you don't have a good, well-working food system in terms of the physical movement of food, uh, you begin to notice it. And the more that the high-income countries notice it, the more serious they'll take the issue in the lower middle-income countries. So that's, that's positive as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's a silver lining coming out of it. I think the second thing that we are waking up to is the fact that our food systems are fragile. 
Um, the Economist ran an article recently saying, you know, global the global food system is holding up pretty well so far, maybe. And I think the key is so far, but the national and the subnational uh, food systems are pretty fr pretty fragile, I think. And I think a lot of the just in time um, mentality and narratives and um, processes that have been built in, if they're slightly off, we end up with a, you know, you've you've missed the boat and you've missed the train and you you've lo you've lost your job and you've you've lost your livelihood and you've lost uh, access to nutritious food. So, I think that's the second thing we're we're realizing how fragile our systems are. And the third thing we're realizing is that. Um, Big shocks create big responses and uh, things that you think are not possible, uh, big policy changes, big investment changes, big changes in norms, uh, are things that are not possible, you think, in normal times become possible. And so you remember that you should be more ambitious and more bold, even in times of non-crisis. So I think the, the opportunities uh, that have arisen to design a food system that is much better uh, that's that's transformed or a series of food systems uh, are several. First one is, I think we've I think we've been reminded how important the indiv indivisibility of, of outcomes is in food systems. That you know when people who work on food systems and work in food systems, they tend to think, well, I'm my thing is uh, improved nutrition or my thing is in is reduced climate um, is mitigation of climate greenhouse gases, or my thing is improved biodiversity, or my thing is hunger reduction and livelihood promotion. Well, all of those things are kind of indivisible and we kind of know it, but we, we, we pretend otherwise. And I think the fact that the, whatever the cause of this crisis, we, we, there's a pretty much a consensus that it's, it's because of human encroachment into, into, um, into, into land that is reserved for wild animals. And so the whole thing about uh, the virus jumping from from animals to, to humans. And, and in fact, the, the MERS example from a few years ago in the Middle East is, is a great example. I think there's an increased sensitivity to this idea that, you know, planetary health, human health and animal health, these things are hard to separate out. Second thing is, I think people are beginning to realize the, the truer costs, or at least I, I think there's an opening to push this idea of the true costs of the food choices, production choices and consumption choices we make. One example is the fact that the, the severity of COVID-19 appears to be linked to com comorbidities that are the result of um, um, the consumption of foods that are high in sugar, salt and fat. So uh, there's, a, co there's a, a severity associated with a comorbidity of obesity and diabetes and hypertension. So and again, these are the, the, the externalities, the, the uncaptured costs that are borne by others of food production choices and food consumption choices. I think there's a realization in the policy space that public procurement is more important than ever. Um, we've seen you know, the, the role of government in this crisis has been shown to be, people who think government is useless uh, are are changing their tune. They see the things that government and only government can do, especially when it's effective government. And I think the role of public procurement, very often governments put out uh, uh, dietary guidelines for their populations, but then their own policies completely fail to follow those guidelines. They will, and this is very much the case in, in the MENA region, they will subsidize bread and oil and sugar uh, when they should also be subsidizing or perhaps even instead of subsidizing fruits and vegetables and pulses. So public procurement is gonna be a big thing. I think finance is going to be really the role of the public sector in de-risking private sector finance. I'm, I'm very worried that this crisis will send all the private sector investment uh, to safe havens. Of course, that's the logical thing for private investors to do. So the public sector really has to be very clever about de-risking private sector investment in making food systems more resilient in the future. Um, and I think finally, the whole idea of resilience of food systems, you know, it waxes and wanes, and I think it will, will have a resurgence and we'll be thinking hard about um, diversity. We'll be thinking about diversity of where we produce food. We'll be thinking about um, whether, whether food, food supply chains really need to be that long all the time. 
And I think we'll be thinking about concentration of power within the food system. And another thing I'm really worried about is with all these SMEs going under and governments really working with the very big companies to ensure food supplies, uh, that's entirely appropriate that they do that. But I'm worried that the big companies will get a much greater hold of the food system um, concentration. And that would make it, I think, less resilient, not more resilient. And my final point is really about data, coming back to one of Patrick's points. I think uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat, uh, I somewhat use hyperbolic terms sometimes, but I, I really think this crisis has, has been a revelation in terms of what it's revealed about the, the paucity of our data systems. And we need a revolution to combat that revelation. In, in data systems. So I, I think this is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, we just need to be bold and, and visionary and work together. That's really, really important. Over. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, I think your point about the opportunity, uh, or the opportunities is, is very important to, you know, as a later takeaway message. Um, the next question goes to, again, Lemis Joma. Uh, one of your research, uh, well, one area of your research focuses on, on nutrition for young children. Um, why are children at heightened risk of nutrition insecurity as a result of COVID-19? And what actions you know, can parents or caregivers uh, take to support proper nutrition among children despite the pandemic? Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so um, I, I think addressing why children are at most risk, I think we've been, we've been talking about that from the beginning. It, the importance of protecting this particularly vulnerable population that could be at risk of, uh, of all the different conditions, whether inadequate access to food, whether inadequate access to health and hygiene and sanitary conditions, all of which can increase the risk of malnutrition. So the, the challenge with COVID-19 is that it's aggravating some of those or many of those factors. Uh, I also want to um, kind of think here more about instead of uh, talking about a situation analysis of why children could be at most risk of what could we do about that? What could be some of the basic nutrition tips, even as nutritionists, as public health professionals, what are we giving out? Uh, we know that young children, when we're talking about the first two years of a, of a child's life are critical for their growth and development, for uh, making sure that uh, we're protecting their immunity against all illnesses, including COVID-19. So the number one thing we talk about today is, and, and every day, is breastfeeding. We want to make sure that we're getting optimal nutrition through promoting breastfeeding during this critical window of opportunity. And, and we want to make sure that it's going to be continued uh, during this crisis because there's some myths and, and some uh, confusion and a lot of fear by some parents or families all across the world, including here in this region, about whether you have enough milk or, or all of that, or whether we should be complementing uh, other than non than, you know other sources for the breast milk. And we want to make sure that we protect breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life. So this is the one of the major, if you want, uh, takeaway messages I'd like to, to highlight today is that we continue promoting that. And I know that this is uh, not just a WHO recommendation for a non-crisis, but uh, during emergencies and during crisis, we want to make sure that this happens. It saves lives. It saves children's lives, for sure. And it also saves money. It's economic. Because once we get the kids off of breast milk and they get into the infant formula, this is where I'm very concerned, and all of us are concerned as public health professionals, is what kind of economic costs we're having on the family, not just in terms of the purchasing of the infant formula, um, but also in terms of the economics of the health expenditures and whatnot. So there's a lot that we can encourage families to, to promote breastfeeding for the nutritional benefits, for the immunological benefit, for the economic benefits. That's, that's an ongoing thing. And, and along that, what, what I want to say is that I know that this is something we're working on um, in the country and, and also globally, is we want to highlight that even if parents and new moms are contracting or have symptoms of COVID-19, that they can actually continue to breastfeed. So that's important to keep in mind. They can be wearing protective masks. They need to make sure that they're washing their hands. The basic hygiene practices that are needed before and after touching their kids, uh, you know, uh, disinfecting surfaces, this is all um, ongoing and we need to highlight that. And even if she can't in severe conditions, she can express milk. And even if she can't, there, there are other ways that we can ensure that we can encourage her. There is, um, there's relactation, there's wet nursing, there's all kinds of things that we want to make sure that the optimal nutrition is through breastfeeding. But the story doesn't end there. Uh, there are parents that are, you know, providing complementary feeding, and this is where also another big, I think, opportunity for us to intervene is what, uh, you know, how much food and what kind of food is being given to the parent, to the kids during this, econo during this economic slash also health crisis uh, that we're witnessing here is 
are we ensuring that the kids are having diversified diets, that they're getting the fruits and vegetables that they need, or are the parents going for the higher in, you know, processed foods that are higher in sugar and salt and that are cheaper and that are actually definitely not, nutri not nutritious, but they have a longer shelf life. So that's a big challenge that we face is that what kind of purchasing uh, behaviors we're noticing now. And the, the panic buying that I mentioned earlier in the webinar is actually going in this direction. People are not panic buying and going for hoarding of fruits and vegetables. We're going for those that are non-perishable, the, the non-perishable items that could contribute to increase um, you know, the, the consumption of unhealthy uh, foods. And that can actually increase risk of obesity and can increase risk of diseases later in life. So we're getting into a health, you know, further straining the health system, if you may, if we were to go like that. Um, I also want to bring into the attention uh, the importance of the school age population, the children and the adolescents. I know your question was about young children, Martin, but um, if you allow me, I just want to say that providing healthy and variety of meals, particularly during this uh, crisis, is very important for this population because they've lost the chance of getting more than 50% in some instances, their food from the schools. And with the closure of the schools, and because we're going to the summer, we have kids that will go hungry from the US all the way to Lebanon, across all countries in the world. School meals protect lives and save lives. And for that matter, the, the I think Lauren, you've mentioned it early on, the importance of ensuring that take-home rations are being given, the adequate food that is being provided to replace whatever we've lost, because this is an opportunity. This is one of those social protection mechanisms that we can't let go of, we need to bolster. And we need to think about how to adapt it, to be smart, to be innovative, to be cost efficient, and what kind of messaging comes with it? Uh, what kind of use of social media or WhatsApp messages or you know, what kind of um, information educational tools can we adjunct with these interventions so that we don't miss out the boat that maybe today, is the chance to teach our kids where does the food come from? I have three-year-old kids that today are seeing their mom more in the kitchen than they've ever seen her. They're seeing us talking about how to prepare food from, from scratch, which is something that not really entertained before. And I know that there are older kids that are being very anxious about their stay at home. And we need to make sure that instead of getting them into the unhealthy snacks and unhealthy behaviors and even sleeping patterns, which is another I know dimension, but if we don't talk about like the lack of normalcy that the kids have like been going through, they've actually been all over the map in terms of behaviors, eating, lifestyle changes, no physical activity. So, so, so I think the question is we should address a lot and we can because we already have the existing programs. It's just a matter of innovative methods, uh, what to bolster, what's the cost that comes with it. And I think it goes back to Dr. Patrick Webb's point of do we know really the cost effectiveness? I think some of them we do but not necessarily in all places. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna also wrap up here as well. Thank you for that. Our next question is back to Professor Patrick Webb. Professor Webb, given the recent lockdowns in Asia and the migration that's been reported out of urban areas back to rural areas, how does this play into a rural urban divide in relation to food and nutrition security? Okay, thanks, Rachel, and, and thanks for all the previous uh, panelists' inputs. Um, first, uh, if you allow me, a quick aside, building on the issue of nutrition for young children. I recently started doing some uh, long-term research in Jordan, focused on uh, infant and young child feeding issues, and, and seeing you know, incredibly low rates of exclusive breastfeeding, on the one hand, which is uh, what you're alluding to, which clearly has to be fixed, and also quite poor wash, hygiene and sanitation behaviors, particularly in poor urban uh, areas as well as uh, rural. So we really do need to be communicating uh, encouragement and support for women to breastfeed, but that also means ensuring the women's diets are protected or enhanced, and that hash, hand washing and other practices are um, improved. And that means, of course, we need to be understanding about the supply and relative price of soap, for example, or access and price of water, right? So this is where food links to wider food system um, drivers. Uh, one bright spot turning back to Asia, um, I was involved heavily in the 2015 earthquake in Nepal, which killed thousands of people. But one of the bright spots was that exclusive breastfeeding actually seemed to have increased during that period. Um, partly, I would argue, because of large-scale programming 
uh, across many NGOs that, that was promoting and supporting exclusive breastfeeding. And it, it, seen, it, it stuck and it seems to have worked. So that, that is, I agree, uh, an absolute priority. But if supply chains for let's say, perishable nutrient rich foods are broken or weakened, so what, what do people buy in urban areas? Uh, several people have said quite clearly, there's a shift because of relative pricing and availability towards shelf stable foods, non-perishable. And Lawrence mentioned the risk of non-communicable diseases associated with a poor quality diet. Um, in high income, countries, there's, there's an idea that's, that's really strongly supported by social media, that people in lockdown stuck at home, they're cooking up amazing, delicious dinners. Yeah, only wealthy people can do that, who have access to the right foods, but also have a good kitchen and the knowledge and the facility to do so. So many people, perhaps most in low income regions of, of South Asia, cannot do that, especially among refugee and displaced people, uh, populations, due to cost, lack of cooking facilities, sometimes lack of knowledge. So the distributional effects of food price rises or volatility or dynamics has to be front and center of, of this discussion in terms of impact and intervention. Uh, and I'm more concerned about that, about the rich-poor divide, than conventional rural-urban divide. Uh, and Lawrence mentioned the public procurement dimension, which is mainly urban, seeks theoretically to reach the poor, but forever has continued to, and continues to bias access to calories um, rather than nutrient-rich foods. And hence, there is an opportunity to do something different. But specifically, yes, there is urban-rural migration, um, urban poor are very, very much at, rich, at risk, not just in South Asia, but elsewhere. Um, and in previous food price crises, 2007, 2011, and 12, millions of people moved, moved back to their villages, um, in large part because that's where they knew they could access food. But a few years later, they were back in the towns. And that's largely due to opportunity because in part, uh, a lack of policies and investments uh, that support and generate attractive, both farm and non-farm rural jobs and incomes, right? It's more than medium enterprises, but also marketing and trade and food service industries in rural areas, right? So we have to fix that anyway to make the entire food system more resilient. Um, and again, the fact that so many urban poor have recently moved back to rural areas offers potentially an opportunity for the, the social protection packages to focus on this dimension, non-farm rural jobs and incomes. But there is also a rural, rural migrant dimension, right? So we've been seeing news that uh, of migrant labor uh, moving from Punjab in India and Haryana and so on back to Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh, as well as internationally, right? From India to Nepal or from Myanmar to Cambodia. Agricultural labor that often moves for years at a time um, is not cost free. And the question is, will, on the one hand, will demand for that agricultural labor return to normal, whatever that is, next year? But even if it does, will those poor rural migrant laborers be able to afford to make that international move again, the trek again next year? So, so much is unknown, underst poorly understood about the flows of labor across the food system, not just the flows of food across the food system. So I think in seeking to protect the poor, both rural and urban, we really do need not just more information, but we need innovation to generate new kinds of jobs across the food system, not just in agriculture. Um, and we need to focus on this, this labor dimension of job creation, which is going to be essential to build resilience, let's say, uh, in the food system going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, our next question goes to Nakhla Walla. Um, what role can academics and researchers play in defending and advancing food and nutrition security in the face of daunting challenges like COVID-19? Nakhla? Yeah, I, I think we have, I, I can't, 
you know, I can't accept think about, about doing the uh, research that is needed, the knowledge that is that needs to be generated in these difficult times. There is a lot, and we ha everybody said it, there is a lot of uh, data that is needed in order to make, um, to make decisions that are well based on science, on evidence, and to be credible. Because there is a lot of misinformation, Patrick has said, and there is a, a huge lot of misinformation that is circulating around. Everybody has an idea about what to do. So I think academics are somehow people that are trustworthy, that people listen to, and they have to come out of their cocoon and really speak to the people and provide their knowledge and provide their input in order to help the community in the areas, in the different areas that uh, they are experts in. So I think it's more of, a, more of a responsibility now than ever because of the huge misinformation and the lack of data and the practices that is uh, overwhelming the population. So data generation is my first priority. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nahla. Rachel? Our next question is for Lauren Landis. Lauren, you've alluded to this a bit, but we just hoped you could expand on the role that the Rome-based institutions like WFP are playing to prevent those worst outcomes in terms of food and nutrition security, and specifically in the MENA countries, if you have anything to say on that. Yeah, maybe we could speak a lot about the, the MENA region, which is an extremely diverse one and therefore probably one of the most difficult to, to tackle. Um, because we're looking at some of the largest humanitarian emergencies that we see globally when you talk about Yemen and Syria and then add the complications of a, a COVID-19. So very, very difficult to prepare for and respond to. And in those cases, we're gonna have to look at, you know, pre-positioning food and some of the very core basic humanitarian um, interventions that you think of very traditionally. But in other parts of the MENA region, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Lebanon has already been talked about today and I'll, I'll give a Lebanon example. Sudan, we see the oil as being export and the market falling apart being a, a huge uh, crisis that has had yet another economic impact in addition to already uh, challenges political or otherwise that were already there. And of course, all of those we're very fe fearful are gonna have a large impact already we see uh, on the food systems. The challenge is, is that the responses are very different depending on what uh, we see in different countries. And we've already uh, talked about some of it today. I mean, in countries where you may be worried about overweight and obesity, the interventions and the challenges are gonna be much different than in ones where we see treatment like Yemen and, and, and where we need more traditional prevention and treatment of acute malnutrition. And then throughout the MENA region, as I think uh, uh, Lawrence has already alluded to, we're looking at much more, how do we prevent further micronutrient deficiencies and how can we help bring those smallholder farmers and those uh, those fortifiers, those, uh, those premixes players together when they're having trouble connecting to make sure that we can still provide a fortified staple uh, in, in, for wheat and many of the other basic commodities. So there's a lot of different challenges in, in the, the region. Uh, maybe I'll just go with Lebanon a little bit just because we've already talked about it so much and I can just speak to it uh, for a, for a moment. One, um, I, uh, we've been watching Lebanon and those price increases, uh, even in the first quarter of 2020, we were very, very much concerned and they, Lebanon made our severe list um, in terms of the cost of a basic uh, food basket, even before this crisis hit. 
And now, of course, we have we even more concerns. Um, just to Nala's question, we have done in WFP above and beyond what's been done by, by Save the Children and others, about 30 uh, cost of diet studies around the world. And we would very much love to bring it to Lebanon. So maybe we can have a further dialogue uh, outside of, of this conversation. But maybe one of the most interesting things about Lebanon is the way the World Food Program is addressing uh, the refugees, uh, the Syrian refugees, who are in Lebanon. And that's done through a retail program initially designed to address um, and, and make it easier for us to provide cash, no food, to, buy, to provide cash to refugees and help local retailers to su supply adequate uh, food. And what we found is through money we can put on a card, we can also see what people are buying and what the price impact is having on what they're able to consume as a family. And this is something that we're really very much studying both as we need to adjust what kind of a benefit they would receive to make sure that they can provide their family with a nutritious diet. But it also allows you to take a little bit of a look at the differences of what people actually buy when they see a crisis upon them. So this is one of the analytical tools that we can study more in this region and hopefully can help us to better understand not just what's going on in Lebanon, but the impact that it could be having uh, in the broader region. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren and everyone else. We now move to um, Q and A's. We already received a few questions and I'd like to start with uh, a question by Rami Zureik, uh, one of our professors here, also uh, a former member of the high level panel of experts. And he posed this question to uh, Lawrence Haddad. Um, the pandemic has seen an intensification in the calls to reform the broken food system. What are the main characteristics of this uh, food system we would like to see and more importantly, how to get there as food security is embedded into the global financial system? Very big question, but possibly you have an answer for Rami. Uh, I, I, I don't have a good answer, I think. I think it's, um, first of all, I don't think it's really broken. I think it's just pointing in the wrong direction. And the, I, my view is that the incentives are all, are all wrong. And if we could get the incentives right, uh, which is not easy, but if you can get them right, then you can get a, a food system that generates more of the outputs and outcomes we want. So some of the, if you think about the incentives, uh, and if you think about mm, the initial settings on a food system, uh, public policy is really important. So there are, there are so many things that one could do in public policy to get the incentives right for big businesses to do, to produce, to be a big part of the, a bigger part of the solution, and a smaller part of the problem. There are so many things the governments could do to make their own behavior outside of the food system uh, actually, but, also, but nevertheless impacts the food system that could change. So I think public policy is a big driver. I think investment incentives are a big driver. Most investment incentives, public and private, are not geared towards nutritious foods. Uh, they could be. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a question of choice. Um, demand from consumers is another big incentive driver. Companies respond to demand. They also shape demand. I think most public campaigns for healthier foods are pretty weak and uh, not money not very well spent. They need to be designed in a way that makes the messaging stickier, more engaging, more attractive, more emotional, um, more like the private sector, but with the right messages. I think civil society could do more in terms of accountability metrics. We, there are lots of accountability metrics out there. Sometimes there are too many, and not enough of them are very good, are very focused on really getting companies to change behaviors. And I think the final sort of incentive I would uh, look, at, look at changing is uh, empl employees. A lot of employees, especially younger employees, really want to work for companies and, and government departments that have a social purpose to them. 
So what can we do to incentivize companies uh, to attract the right kinds of employees? Uh, I think it's a very, it's in companies' self-interest to do this. So, so I think the way you change the way you change the incentives, whether it's consumers, governments, investors, employees, civil society, that's how you change the system. The difficulty is that that requires a lot of uh, fights, a lot of political economy fights, and a lot of courage, and a lot of um, collective action, and a, and, a, and a real sort of sense of grit to stick with it. That's, that's the difficult bit. But that the bigger the consequences become, the bigger the costs are, uh, hopefully the more the uh, the more revolutionary uh, not only will governments get but all the people who are trying to change government and civil society and business behavior the more emboldened they will become over thank you Lawrence and um, the next question which was asked and already responded to in writing by Patrick Webb but I think it's such an interesting question by Kerry Wozni um, Patrick there's a challenge uh, uh, with evidence-based interventions in the era of COVID-19. You mentioned that many countries are in with large stimulus packages for social protection uh, and so on. Given the challenges in in-person data collection now, how could research be collected to understand various interventions to develop an evidence based on the impact of these responses on nutrition outcomes, assuming the effects will be different in COVID versus non-COVID times? Mm -hmm. So, my response to, to that interesting question was, of course, there are ways to, to get around in person these days. Lauren just mentioned tapping into data flows related to actual practices of purchases through electronic cards. Uh, obviously, phone-based surveys have become increasingly credible and validate, increasingly validated as well. Um, none of these are, are perfect. But I, my bigger point was that literally 10 very large amounts of money are being committed to very large intervention packages related, whether they're stimulus packages or specific cash transfers, social protection more broadly. We're talking very, very large amounts of money. And as is typically the case, a very small amount of that is being dedicated to monitoring and evaluating and assessing the actual effectiveness of the distribution of those, those funds. And therefore, it's, it represents another opportunity that has to be of demand that is voiced for, well, that, that's great. You're spending $2 billion on X. Uh, there needs to be not just an academic demand, but uh, you know, it's essentially, this is about constituencies. This is taxpayer money by and large. We need to be requiring careful assessment. Not was it used properly, but how was it used? What was the impact and how cost-effective were those outcomes? That, that was the gist of that. Allow me just to, to, ampl to amplify what Lawrence said, which I, I totally agree, but I think it's a really important point to, to make. It sounds almost trivial to say, no, the food system isn't broken. But it's a really fundamental point that it's not broken. What it is doing is what it was designed to do many decades ago, which was ensure as, uh, as high a volume and output of calories as possible for as many people around the world. That's essentially what it is. Right? And the food systems have grown around that. And therefore it's not broken and requires fixing to make it back where it was, we have to somehow move beyond this backward looking agenda to a forward looking agenda. And I repeat what Lawrence said, what already today, the single largest contributor to the global burden of disease is poor quality of diet. And that's only going to grow over the next 20, 30 years. Therefore, we need to be reshaping our food systems in a forward looking sense to what do we need to have in place within 30 years, and then how do you get there, but to ensure that the food system is delivering an affordable, healthy, sustainable diet for many hundreds of millions of more people than it is today, right? So that's not just fixing a broken system, that's transforming a food system and looking forward rather than backward. And all the incentive structures that Lawrence talked about 
need to be carefully scrutinized and, and in terms of will they deliver that healthy diet in 30 years or will they not and then draw the appropriate conclusions. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two more questions. One is to Dr. Nahla. Um, the question is on food distribution in, uh, in, on the household level and how effective can be the low cost diet and you know, what kind of problems are there associated with uh, you know, less uh, access to food and household food security in particular, perhaps here in, in the Arab context. Nahla, do you have an answer to this question? Um, when, uh, I hope I understood it well. Um, is it because people are getting deliveries to their houses? Is that no, it's, it's about, for example, you know, you have gender inequality in uh, household food security. You have uh, issues with the, uh, you know, food distribution that not everyone gets uh, what they should get. You know, there's a lot of literature on this. Do you fear like similar patterns emerging that, for example, young girls may not get uh, the same amount of food as, for example, young boys? And in all our studies, in all our studies, even you know, many many years ago, until now, we have not seen this kind of um, of approach to uh, girls and boys in one household. This is a, a myth in Lebanon. It doesn't exist. I I I have never ever found it in any of the studies that we have uh, uh, conducted on the nutrition and the food. Uh, uh, delivery. It is. It is in the West. It is thought that they, you know, they feed the boys more than the girls. But there are habits in certain uh, Mena countries where the boys eat first and then the girls come in and eat afterwards. But discrimination from the parents, I have not seen it. So I. How was it? If they can afford to to acquire the nutritious food, I think always in our culture, the, the little ones get most attention, whether they are girls or boys. Thank you so much, Natha. Very uh, positive news. Um, my, uh, Michael from Uganda is asking uh, the final question because we're running out of time. And this goes to Lauren Landis, and perhaps it's the question of questions. He's asking, do you think uh, WFP can cope with the increased demands in terms of uh, food handouts, food aid over the next few months? Or, you know, what would this mean for your organization? What kind of uh, additional requirements do you have? Lauren? Yeah, I, I think that the, the demands are huge. Um, we've started with the most basic things of getting three to six months uh, supply of, of food based on initial assessment, assessments pre-positioned. But as uh, we've all discussed today, that's just to address the, the preliminary disruption. I think the real challenge is gonna be to properly understand the sort of medium to longer term impact, and then to work as a global community to really address those. So it's not just about um, getting food aid where it needs to be, but as has been said so well today, to really think as, as a community uh, about how we're going to, well, basically think differently about how we're gonna design the systems. Um, I think more people than ever understand food systems because of the way they've impacted their lives uh, uh, today uh, during this crisis that I think we now need to think about how to come together as a stronger community to address food systems and well beyond those uh, very immediate impacts, which we're working very hard to um, um, address and to get ready and to prevent, but really uh, focus on those medium to longer term impacts. And that we have to do all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's been a fascinating, fascinating almost 100 minutes and uh, we're very grateful for your time. Just as uh, a brief introduction to next week's seminar, we have another, I think, is going to be a very fascinating uh, webinar on 
uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the future of food systems. And this time we have Robert Parberg of Harvard University. We have Tom Hertel of Purdue University. We have uh, uh, Chris Perry, former World Bank, Professor Tony Allen, SOAS and King's College in London, and myself. We're going to discuss this topic next week, same time, four o'clock uh, Beirut time. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks everyone for joining this uh, fascinating webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you all.